the Quran has some pretty nasty verses and it only gets worse when you dive into hadiths and fiqh. Harris, are you going to talk about those disgusting verses in the Quran, like Quran 456, where the all-powerful God is going to inflict pain on us puny humans for not recognizing that he's the greatest dictator in the universe? Or the verses where he details how he's going to burn the skin of infidels and then regrow it so that the torture never ends? Nah, those are pretty nasty verses, but no, not by Marvin. Okay, are you going to show verse 532 where Allah orders the believers to cut off hands and feet from opposite ends of dissidents? Oh yeah, that's a pretty nasty verse too, but mm, no, not that one today. Oh, I see. You're going to show a verse like 929 where the soldiers of Allah attack unsuspecting villagers for refusing to submit to their brutal and dictatorial world order. No, as nasty as that is, that's nothing by Islamic standards. Okay, Harris, here you're definitely going to show Quran 424 where Muslim men are allowed to kill infidel men and take their wives as sex slaves. Oh yeah, that's right up there. But maybe I should make another part of this. But no, I mean, those verses are seriously awful. But hold up, there's more. What if I dropped a bombshell on you and said there was something even worse? Okay, Aris, come on. What could be more messed up than burning people, cutting off people's limbs, raping and pillaging? Well, I um, mean, as you know, pretty much not all, but most cultures out there agree that we should keep our hands off children. And check this out. As brutal as Islam is towards adults, it's downright horrific when it comes to children especially little girls. When there are signs of physical maturity, it becomes permissible for the husband in Islamic law to have marital relationships or consummate the relation with his bride. And this is the example of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Do you know well, what precocious puberty is? Starting puberty unusually early. Like, yeah. Is there anything in Islam that prevents you from, in a man marrying a five-year-old that started precocious puberty? You can arrange a marriage even as an infant, but that doesn't mean that sex is allowed. Could a man have a marriage to a five-year-old consummated if she started precocious puberty? If she starts showing signs of physical maturity, then yes, that's permissible, as I said, principle. Four. If there are signs Three. of... So this is something that becomes biologically impossible because precocity, there are no... I have a shows no, it goes as early as 11 months. Well, that's something that the parents would not... Uh, the, see, the thing about Islamic marriage is that parents are involved at these ages. And when you look at the marriage of the Prophet, peace be upon him, but before we go further, please like this video to maximize its reach. Also subscribe to this channel if you haven't already done that and press the bell icon so you keep getting amazing videos like this one. If you would like to support the channel, please consider becoming a member by hitting that join button or becoming a patron by going to patreon.com forward slash xmuslim. Also, check out my friend Armin Nawabi's Atheist Republic channel where Armin and Atheist Republic CEO Susanna bring you exciting commentary on current affairs. Thanks, Harris. On Atheist Republic's YouTube channel, Susanna and I discuss crazy religion-related events from all around the world every week. Come check us out. Now let's get back to the most disgusting verse of the Quran. Before we dive into the most disgusting verse in the Quran, let me explain the process of idda in Islam to you. Idda is a waiting period that divorced women have to go through to ensure they're not pregnant with their ex-husband's child. Now, it is worth noting that the creator of the universe, Allah, which is the fake idea of Prophet Muhammad, apparently did not foresee the future advancements in DNA technology that would make this practice of idda obsolete. Despite this obvious lack of foresight from the supposedly all-knowing Allah, the practice is still codified for eternity in the Quran, specifically in chapter 65 verse 4. However, there is a catch to this. Since the purpose of idda is to ensure the divorced wife is not pregnant, it doesn't apply to divorced wives or ex-wives who have not had sexual relations with their ex-husbands. This particular process is codified in the Quran, chapter 33, verse 49. Oh, you who believe when you marry the believing women and then divorce them before you have touched them, then they have no obligation of any idda, i.e. waiting period. So what we have established from this verse is that the waiting period is only applicable to women or girls, as you'll soon find out, who have had sex with their husbands. No sex, no waiting period. 
So the point is to make sure that you can tell which children are from the new husband. Now, let's delve into the subject of this video, the most disgusting verse in the Quran, which is chapter 65, verse 4. It states, and those women from among you who have despaired of further menstruation, meaning of old age, if you are in doubt, meaning that covers pretty much every other possibility, then the idda is three months, as well as of those who have not yet menstruated, meaning they are young girls, meaning prepubescent girls. Remember what I said earlier that this idda is only applicable to those whom you have had sexual relations with? In this Quranic verse, it is clearly saying that those who have not yet menstruated because they are too young, their idda is also three months. This Quranic verse essentially allows you to marry and have s with prepubescent girls. This religion legitimizes what we commonly call fear. Then it makes me laugh when I see naive Christians and Muslims joining forces against this woke madness of sexualizing children. If you're so against the wokes for sexualizing children, then you should also be against Islam, which allows child marriage. Christians, okay, it makes sense, but Muslims? Their prophet, the founder of Islam, the greatest man who ever lived, the man whose character is to be emulated by every Muslim, did just that. If he grows his beard, then Muslims grow their beards too. If he marries multiple women, so do Muslims. However, he was allowed to have more than four wives, but ordinary Muslims must stop at just four wives. Poor Muslim men. Come on, guys. I mean, he was the prophet of the creator of the universe. Surely God had to make sure his favorite man is sexually satisfied, no? Even Muhammad's favorite wife, Aisha, once suggested that God seems to send down verses to satisfy Muhammad's desires. If he owned sex slaves like Maria al Kittiya, so can ordinary Muslims. He loved dates, mm, not those ones. Although he loved those too. I'm talking about these dates. Then Muslims also pretend to love eating dates. So if Prophet Muhammad marries a little girl, then so can ordinary Muslim men. Yes, as you probably know, Prophet Muhammad married a little girl called Aisha, who was only six years old. And he, I hate to use this word, consummated his marriage when she was only nine. There are multiple hadiths, the sayings and accounts of Prophet Muhammad that confirm this event, such as Sahih al-Bukhari 3896 or Sunnah Nasai 3257, Sahih al-Bukhari 5133, 5134, 5158, Sunnah ibn Majah 1877. This is a Mutawatir hadith. Mutawatir hadith is an event that has been reported by multiple independent sources. When it comes to hadiths, Mutawatir hadith is right at the top. For example, if a hadith has been reported by only one source and is embarrassing, then lipstick Muslims can discard it by saying, well, it is only coming from one source, therefore we reject it. Like this lipstick scholar of Islam, Dr. Jawad Hashmi. When I tell you that actually historical critical scholarship disproves that Aisha was nine years old, when I tell you that, and when I tell you that historical critical scholars actually say that the hadiths are very, very suspect and questionable to the point where they say that no hadith can be taken as actually going back to the Prophet Muhammad. We and that the Quran... Islam. Wait, hold on. Hold on. No, it's not. Because you could still you destroyed use destroyed Islam. Hadith. What are you no, left with? Hold on. Because you could still use the hadith. There's all been a long... So when it suits you, you can use a good hadith and you can no, throw away a bad hadith? When you ha no, you still have a methodology. Yeah, because yeah, the methodology that the methodology that you formulated to throw can, away the bad hadiths. Traditional Islamic scholars, however, look at the authenticity or the character of the source. But in this case, it has been reported by Aisha herself, by Hisham's father, by Abu Abaida, and by Urwa. So as far as hadiths go, this is as solid as it can get. If this hadith can't be trusted, then no hadith can be trusted. And Muslims know the implications because if we throw the hadiths out of Islam, we are left with no Islam at all. So, to save Islam, the scholars of Islam have to respect the importance of hadith, which means they must sanction child marriage. But they don't realize that in order to defend this one disgusting act of their prophet, they are literally destroying Islam. Okay, Harris, I get it. This is so bad and it's hard to imagine anyone defending it. Surely there must be Muslims decent enough who have counter arguments to this disgusting practice. Yes, I mean, unlike Muslim apologists, I am intellectually honest. So I will give you their counter arguments too. Any Muslim who is against 
has to reject this Quranic verse. But since it's the literal word of Allah, you can't discard a single word out of it. Otherwise, you will be labeled a kafir. So, modern yet decent Muslims find a way around it. Which is, if you can't change the verse, then change the meaning of the verse. Since this verse is very embarrassing, Muslims who understand this argument hide behind the Arabic language and say the word yet is superficially inserted in this verse by perverted scholars who wanted to marry little girls. Then the question arises, who is the Quran talking about here? As well of those who have not menstruated. The Quran has already spoken about women who do not menstruate of old age. Ah, there is one more category left, such as Women who just don't menstruate because of some sort of an illness, like amano, amanorrhea, amanorrhea, amano, this one. So let's look at the language argument. A vast majority of native Arabic speakers, as well as those who have learned the Arabic language, say that the Quran here is talking about girls who have not menstruated yet because of young age, i.e., pre-pubescent girls. Let's look at some of the classical Islamic scholars, as well as modern ones. Respected classical scholars like Ibn Qasir, Al-Jalalain, and many more confirm that the Quran here is referring to pre-pubescent girls. Contemporary scholars like Madudi, Taqi Usmani, Muhammad Ali Mirza, etc., and there are tons more, all agree that the Quran here is talking about pre-pubescent girls. And who can forget our very own Muhammad Hijab, who also says that the Quran allows you to consummate your marriage with pre-pubescent girls. If you look just at the Quran, you will get the indication that you can have sexual intercourse with a five-year-old. The reason why it's haram to have sexual intercourse with a five-year-old is not found in the Quran at all. If you just read the Quran, it is halal, it would just it would be halal to have sexual intercourse with a five-year-old. According to Muhammad Hijab, a native Arabic speaker, and someone who is quite knowledgeable about Islam, you cannot stop someone from marrying and consummating his marriage with a pre-pubescent girl. But yes, you'll find some contemporary Muslim scholars who do say that the Quran here is talking about women who do not menstruate due to an illness, and not because of young age. So there are two points to that. One, the greatest book written by the greatest author of all time, Allah, was so unclear that it left Muslims not understanding what Allah meant. Think about all the little girls who got married, even post prepescent girls like nine or ten year old girls who had to pay such a heavy price of losing their childhood innocence to some horny old man just because Allah, the all-knowing, the creator of the universe, couldn't convey his message clearly? That doesn't sound like the creator of the universe. The second point to counter these modern scholars is that it is most likely not talking about the women suffering from some illness because the general rule of the Quran is that it talks about what happens in general, not about the exceptions. For example, this Quranic verse of chapter 24 verse 2 prescribes fornicating men and women be given hundred lashes. This is a general rule. What about men and women who are intellectually challenged, who don't know what they're doing? What is the punishment for those kind of fornicators? The Quran is silent on that, but we do have hadiths that say that people who are mentally challenged can't be punished, such as Sunan ibn Majah 4398. The Messenger of Allah said, there are three persons whose actions are not recorded, a sleeper till he awakes, an idiot till he restored to reason, and a boy till he reaches puberty. Why didn't the Quran talk about this exception? Because the Quran is a made-up book by Prophet Muhammad, and he used to make up stuff as he went along. Okay, that's my cheeky comment. But Muslims defend this by saying that the Quran only talks about general ideas, not exceptions. This is where they come and say that this was normal back then, or give you examples of other people who did the same. But here's the thing, if it was normal back then, then your religion is a problem. Your religion makes it harder to keep it for back then. It makes it difficult to progress out of them. Because unlike other people who might have done the same thing, your religion teaches that your prophet is a role model for all people at all time. What the Orthodox Muslims say is... Pretty much nothing really. The Orthodox Muslims admit that the Quran's language is clear and it does include pre-pubescent girls. However, the Hadith takes precedence in this case. They use these Hadiths as a reason for not consummating marriage with pre-pubescent girls. They say, since the Prophet married Aisha when she was six, but waited until nine for her to reach the age of puberty, therefore, 
Muslims can only consummate the marriage after the girl has reached the age of puberty. This shows that this Quranic verse is so disgusting that even hardcore Muslims don't want to accept that and would put the hadith above the Quran. Secondly, the fact that the Prophet Muhammad waited for Aisha until she reached the age of nine is not necessarily a guarantee that he was waiting for her to reach the age of puberty because it is not specifically mentioned anywhere in the Hadith books. Even the age of nine is still pretty disgusting, but let's just go with it. There could be any number of reasons why Muhammad waited until Aisha reached the age of nine. It could be that he thought Aisha is too young for him to take care of, as he already had four children to look after. Why add another one? It could be that Abu Bakr might have simply declined. The point is, we can easily imagine any reason other than puberty. Secondly, since when did the Hadith start taking precedence over the Quran? So, to conclude, the lipstick Muslims have simply changed the meaning of the Quran, while the orthodox Muslims have put the Hadith above the Quran. Either way, this verse is clear that the Quran allows men to consummate their marriage with prepubescent girls. Yeah, absolutely disgusting. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like, subscribe to the channel and share it with others so that more people can become aware of this horrible Islamic practice. Until the next video, take care and goodbye. If you like my video and would like to support my channel, then you can be my patron by going to patreon.com forward slash xmuslim or you can simply buy me a coffee.